uh, Jeffrey Sachs. He's a professor of economics and director of the Earth Institute in Col at Columbia University. He's also a senior UN advisor who has been called by the New York Times probably the most important economist in the world. Professor, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Can you hear me and see me? We can hear you. We can hear you. Let's see. First, and now we can see you. <laughs> You're welcome. Wonderful. Let me say what an incredibly brilliant initiative you have, and uh, really the model for a global conference. Thank I've you. thought for a long time, why don't we do this with General Assembly meetings? Why don't we do this with the uh, world parliamentarians? I think what you have is uh, astoundingly important, not only about climate change, but uh, in general, such a, a, a gorgeously presented conference. So I'm, I'm really impressed and really grateful. Thank you. And thank and, you for uh, being a part of it. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, we, we don't have time, but we do have a way. And I think that is really the theme. We don't have time in the in the literal sense that we have filled the atmosphere with uh, enough greenhouse gases that we are just on the verge of wrecking the planet. And we know now that the remaining uh, carbon budget uh, the amount of cumulative carbon dioxide that could be emitted and still stay below uh, the uh, two degree upper limit, which is not even a safe upper limit, but a dire upper limit uh, set in the Paris uh, Climate Agreement is maybe uh, 600 billion tons CO2, something like that, about 15 years at the rate of today's emissions, uh, meaning we have to move to decarbonizing the world energy system. This is the, the simple point. We have to move from a world economy dependent on coal, oil, and natural gas to a world economy based on zero carbon energy, whether wind, solar, hydro, geothermal, nuclear, bioenergy, or other kinds of energy that do not emit carbon dioxide. And we have to do this essentially by mid-century. We have to end net emissions roughly by the year 2050 if we want to have a likely chance that's technically defined as roughly a two-thirds probability, only a two-thirds probability, no certainty, but a two-thirds probability of uh, staying within the Paris upper limit. Now, this is fortunately technically feasible because we can see the pathway to success. And the pathway to success is based on electrification using zero carbon energy. We have to produce electricity for a growing world population and a growing world economy using zero carbon sources. We have to shift from the fossil fuel dependence to electricity based on those zero carbon sources. And we have to electrify those uses of energy, especially automobiles and the heating of buildings that currently are based on, say, an internal combustion engine in the case of vehicles or on a boiler or furnace in the case of buildings to electricity. Uh, for personal mobility, that means uh, most likely battery-operated vehicles of the kind that are now burgeoning in the marketplace. For buildings, it means predominantly uh, electric heat pumps to uh, heat our buildings uh, in the winters. Uh, and, of course, it means energy efficiency, to be using energy in a far more efficient way, which is also technologically feasible with clear uh, roadmaps so that we don't need so much energy still to get the services that we require. So in a sense, this is a quite doable proposition. It's well-defined. It does require a plan of action. It does require a strategy that stretches out 25 or 30 years. Most countries can't do that. Uh, their politics are too disorganized, too short-term, too corrupted to so far have done this right. Sweden typically is doing very well in this in the sense that it has a clear uh, 
line of sight. Stockholm uh, is aiming to decarbonize uh, within this period. The neighboring uh, great cities of Scandinavia, Oslo, Copenhagen, each have plans of action. They're all based on the same principle, zero carbon electricity, electrification of needs, and energy efficiency. And one could add, just as a footnote, that there are particular sectors, uh, for example, shipping or large vehicles that require their own technology pathway, perhaps instead of uh, battery uh, operated electricity, it's fuel cells. So you use renewable energy to produce hydrogen and then you combust the hydrogen, for example, in uh, large ocean going vessels, which is already starting now. I met with a major shipper in uh, Antwerp uh, just uh, 10 days ago, who's converting his massive ocean going uh, freight uh, carrying vessels to uh, uh, hydrogen combustion. Uh, in other words, uh, this is a, a kind of electricity pathway, but with a hydrogen detour. Similarly for aviation, uh, the technology pathway could be synthetic uh, hydrocarbons where uh, renewable energy is used uh, together with carbon dioxide and catalysts to produce synthetic uh, hydrocarbons, which then become the aviation fuel. But suffice it to say, for our purposes, the key is decarbonized by mid-century. The essence of that is a clean grid that you that uh, provides a, an increased load of electricity for electrification of current uses, plus vehicles, plus buildings, plus industrial processes. The technological pathways are rather well understood, even though there are still advances to be made, but rather predictable advances of normal R&D in better batteries, uh, better solvents, better catalysts, uh, better fuel uh, cells, and so on, but nothing extraordinarily uh, out of sight. Now, what is missing, therefore, in the solutions? I would say two big things. Uh, one are plans of action, the knowledge and capacity to look ahead, to understand that we need everywhere in the world, the United States, Canada, the Middle East, China, India, the European Union, need to decarbonize by mid-century, and that there is not so much choice of what to do, though there are specificities depending on whether you have wind or solar or <laughs> geothermal or hydro or others that you need to tap. And you need to tap solutions that are transnational because uh, it is these are issues that can't be solved on a national basis, just as we currently uh, transport and ship uh, coal, oil, uh, and natural gas, uh, so too we should be trading renewable energy across uh, long-distance transmission lines or, or even shipping uh, synthetic hydrocarbons and so forth. So these are transnational plans that are needed, typically regional. And in the U.S., we need to join with Canada and Mexico to have a clean grid, not to do this three countries uh, individually, still less to build a wall with Mexico, the absolutely absurd idea of my president, uh, which uh, makes uh, zero uh, sense, uh, of course. So the first thing is plans of action. The second thing is political economy. And what that means is oil drives you crazy. Oil corrupts politics. Oil buys politicians. You may have noticed that in my crazy country, the United States, uh, the one country in the world out of 193 that has declared the intention to pull out of the Paris Climate Agreement, though we have a crazy president, it's not because our president is crazy that that's happening, actually. It's happening because the Republican leadership in the U.S. Congress is owned and operated by the oil industry. We have big oil that pays huge amounts of campaign contributions, utterly corrupt, though in the American genius, it's all made legal 
which is weird. But the oil companies and oil men like David and Charles Koch pay the campaign contributions of our senators, who then tell the president of the United States, duh, pull out of Paris, because that's what these short-sighted, nasty oil companies are after. Let me give you the list. It's Coke Industries, it's ExxonMobil, it's Chevron, it's ConocoPhillips. It's not a large number. What the hell are they thinking? Because the whole world depends on us decarbonizing. But in their greed, they are perverting the political system for a few more years of profit. Or in Canada, completely weird, you have uh, Justin Trudeau, who is a green uh, and uh, environmentally uh, friendly politician who's defending more pipelines for natural gas. Why? Because politics of the province of Alberta. So to bring it to conclusion, we have to have sound plans based on decarbonizing technologies, and we have to know the fight that we're really in. It's actually not the fight against the ignorance of the people. It's not the confusion of the people, even in the United States, despite all the propaganda. It is big oil, and it's the resistance of 20th century industries that are trying to block the 21st century. One final note, if I might, and then I'll conclude. And that is that uh, China, which has a lot of work to do in decarbonization, has put together a wonderful initiative called the Global Energy Interconnection. And they've made an organization called GEIDCO, G-E-I-D-C-O, Global Energy Interconnection Development Cooperation Organization, with the idea of linking together all of the world's renewable energy into a connected grid to service all of the world for deep decarbonization. It's this kind of bold thinking, planning ahead, looking forward, deliberately investing that can bring us to safety now. There are not technological or economic barriers. We're gonna make it, but we're in the final stages of the political economy battle where corrupted politicians twisted by the interests of big oil are still resisting. But it is movements like we don't have time that will break the hammerlock of the oil industry and enable humanity to save itself. Thanks very much for letting me be with you.